Um, welcome. My name is Elizabeth Anderson. I'm the Executive Director of the American Society of International Law. And it's really a great uh, privilege to have you here tonight for this uh, discussion. Uh, it is an unexpectedly and somewhat tragically timely uh, discussion that we're going to have tonight given events in Libya in the last day. And I thought it would be appropriate to maybe begin with a moment of silence um, to remember Ambassador Stevens and um, his fallen colleagues there uh, in Libya and the perils of working in, uh, in uh, unstable environments. Thank you. I'm really very happy to have you here at ASIL tonight. Um, we are very pleased to have among us members, and would be and should be members. Uh, I hope those of you who are new to ASIL will consider joining us and consider Tiller House a, a home away from home, a place to come and meet colleagues interested in international law and uh, to build your network, network in our field. Our mission is to promote greater understanding and use of international law. We do that through programs such as this, um, through research, through educational activity. Um, and one of the most important aspects of our work uh, is our interest groups. Interest groups uh, are organized among our members on uh, almost 30 different substantive topics, including our Transitional Justice and Rule of Law interest group, which is co-sponsoring tonight's uh, event. We'll hear from uh, uh, one of its leaders, um, Andrew Solomon, in a moment uh, about that group and its activities. Um, I also want to draw your attention to materials on your chairs there and on our website about upcoming events. Be sure to check those out. There's also a flyer on your chair for an upcoming uh, Rule of Law Gala sponsored by the American Bar Association that promises to be um, an important gathering of our community. So uh, without uh, further ado, I'll invite uh, Andrew Solomon here. He is uh, Vice Chair of the Transitional Justice and Rule of Law Interest Group and uh, a Director of the Justice Sector Reform Work at Blue Law International uh, for working in this rule of law sector. Uh, thanks, Betsy. Uh, I'd also like to just add my voice on behalf of the leadership of the Rule of Law and Transitional Justice Interest Group. Uh, to, to Betsy's and, and thanking everyone for uh, joining us this evening what, for what I believe will be uh, undoubtedly an informative and an insightful discussion on the nexus between national security and rule of law promotion uh, abroad. Uh, before I turn it over to uh, Milan Civic, who will uh, be our Master of Ceremonies, uh, who will introduce our speakers and, and moderate the proceedings, I'd like to just briefly sketch out for you some of the activities of the Rule of Law and Transitional Justice uh, Interest Group uh, for the coming year and also ways that uh, we hope to involve you as members, uh, but also as uh, practitioners and, and people interested in rule of law more generally. Uh, first, in the area of uh, thought leadership, we're developing a small piece that is exploring the interrelationships between transitional justice uh, and rule of law. This will be looking at not only the conceptual issues uh, linking the two, uh, but also drilling down into some of the more practical issues, uh, including what are the guiding principles, the leading practices, as well as the entry points for programmatic interventions in this area. Uh, as we draft this up, we'll uh, be relying on uh, practitioners and scholars in the field, including those that, that are a member of the society, uh, for input, and then we'll ultimately disseminate that. Uh, related to uh, that initiative, we'll be drafting a series of ASIL Insights. These are small electronic publications that the Society uh, disseminates. Uh, we'll be addressing a variety of emerging trends and hot topics in the rule of law, whether it's uh, monitoring and evaluation in the, in the design uh, of rule of law, justice, and security sector programs, uh, or you know, what are the, some of the specific rule of law issues implicated in the protection of vulnerable uh, populations, whether they be the disabled, uh, minorities, uh, etc. Uh, also, uh, ASIL convenes uh, practitioners, scholars, uh, and policymakers uh, in the area of, of rule of law as well as international law. Uh, we'll be uh, putting forward a speaker series that uh, draws upon expertise not only 
uh, here uh, in the U.S., but from abroad uh, in topics of, of rule of law. Uh, so stay tuned uh, for that uh, calendar uh, of events, which will be forthcoming uh, shortly. Uh, just very, really briefly, I also want to draw your attention to uh, the upcoming high-level meeting on rule of law at the United Nations General, General Assembly that's scheduled to be uh, uh, convened on the 24th of September at UN headquarters in uh, New York. Uh, the interest group will be representing the society uh, at this meeting. Uh, and we will be reporting back to uh, our members as well as to the, the, the rule of law community here in Washington uh, writ large uh, on the outcome document uh, that uh, is being prepared and will ultimately be agreed upon by participants. So also stay tuned for that. Um, so that's really all I have to say. I want to thank you again and thank you to our panelists. Uh, Moan, you have the floor. And I too would like to say welcome to everybody, to all of our guests here, and the participants, the, the panelists as well. Um, I am a former founder and co-chair of the, this interest group, and I enjoy the work so much, and I'm continuing on. I also work at the U.S. Department of State in rule of law. This evening we have three panelists who together represent the public and private sectors, civil society, and academia and years and years of, of direct experience in rule of law and in national security. They'll draw upon their life experiences to comment on national security reform and rule of law. You have their bias, so I'm going to keep my remarks extremely brief, and I'll proceed with the event. First, we'll hear from Tom Pickering, and then Claire Lockhart, and then Frank Kramer, and I turn the podium over to you, Tom. Thank you, Milan, very much. I wonder if, to avoid the tinny quality of the reproduction system, I might speak out in front of you, and if any of you hear my voice fade, just wave, and I'll wave goodbye to you. <laughs> I'm delighted to be here, and Betsy, thank you very much for your kindness in remembering Chris Stevens and his colleagues. As someone who was a member of the Foreign Service and still continues to believe in it, the sense that America uh, has a sense of interest and sympathy and understanding for the tragedy, but indeed for the setback to American foreign policy interests, and indeed I think to those of Libya, is I think for all of us very rewarding, and thank you very much. Uh, I want to, in a very few minutes, try to do three things. Talk a little bit about the changed atmosphere in which the question we're looking at tonight takes place. And then perhaps talk about the challenges that I see facing the United States, some of which intimately involve dealing with failed states, and then perhaps a few instances where I think rule of law and international legal issues are very prominent, and perhaps some conundrums that they now present to us in dealing with those problems. A big set of issues. In the world of globalization and rapid change, certainly everything we are dealing with moves so rapidly that what happens overnight greatly affects what is going on in the minds of those who are trying to deal with the problems. Uh, we live in a period of information overload. We leave, live in a period of rapid movement. And it means, in fact, that governments and now their partners in the international world, the NGO, academic, press, and all the other worlds that play a prominent role in international relations are assailed by information overload and indeed uh, glued, if I could put it this way, to dealing with the morning mail in whatever form it comes to them, rather than looking long term. And so we have a short term bias and indeed maybe are captured by the short term. Uh, we're in a world where the United States, having tried to resolve diplomatic problems with the use of military force, has found that distinctly wanting where, in a sense, we are thrown back again on the somewhat difficult, not necessarily 100% effective, uh, but often underused tool of diplomacy as a way to deal with the problem. Uh, and diplomacy is more than striped pants, and it's a great deal uh, about marshalling leverage, about building coalitions, 
about understanding problems, about appreciating culture, and indeed by working with people in a common effort to look at win-win solutions. And it seems to me that military efforts tend to leave all of those aside and at the end have made the problems much larger for the diplomats rather than easier to deal with. I think that it is important as well that as we begin to look at issues in today's world, their interconnectedness is often overlooked, particularly in strategic thinking. And so the perfect example, of course, is the critical interrelationship between energy policy, environmental interests, and climate change. But many other series of issues, in fact, appear as a group of questions rather than necessarily single stovepipe issues. And there are two advantages to looking at these strategically in a broader fashion. One is unintended consequences tend to be more able to deal with and even predict if you look, in fact, at the breadth of the impact of issues and the policies that might change issues before the fact rather than after. And for a diplomat, you can find leverage. Uh, often you can find leverage in a related part of the question which is of interest to the parties you're dealing with. And that's even more important in finding win-win solutions in building a set of obviously important goals for both parties. I think it is also important to note that in today's world, economic questions in my view are singularly much more important than they have been for a long time. Uh, but traditional military and strategic thinking is having a, a, a difficult time in getting its mind around those kinds of questions uh, as, as, as we look at them. Uh, taking some advice from myself, I'm now going to talk about seven baskets of issues that I think are very important and a number of them particularly touch on the question of failed states and how and in what way we may be treating with them. And indeed, one critically important question, and it's a long-standing question, is an issue I would describe in broad terms as poverty, growth, and development. And I would add the following words to it, food, health, and water. And then I would add questions like failed and failing states, migration, narcotics and international crime, trade, and you can go on. But you can see, in a sense, how this basket of questions has its interrelationship, uh, which is very important. It doesn't mean that everything is derivative from one or a number of these factors. And some of these factors are very important in helping to resolve the questions of failed and failing states. Uh, but they are interconnected. Another set of issues that I think are very high on the American agenda and ought to be is essentially dealing with the aftermath or indeed the continuation of the 2008-2009 economic crisis. In many ways, it went, as we know, from simple home mortgages into bank failures and indeed to the potential collapse of economies uh, to huge debt issues and indeed to a nearly, if not nearly, perhaps practically, existential problem for the survival of the European community, and indeed major issues of China's future, the US's future, um, and across the board, uh, how and in what way we can begin to treat uh, with some of the questions that form the antecedents of this crisis, uh, but still remain on the shelf uh, because uh, the critical requirement to deal with tomorrow's problems can constantly eclipse uh, such questions as do we need new institutional arrangements or do we need improvement in the current institutional arrangements that begin to deal with these questions long term. And they of course have uh, uh, creatively but very importantly legal basis. Uh, whether they're treaty based, whether they come out of broader international conferences, but how and in what way we attack those issues, and indeed the instruments that make those issues function and perform are certainly very much based um, in now in an international society, heavily doted with the uh, acronymical uh, plethora of international organizations which only the most knowledgeable in any particular field 
uh, can interpret for us and then only in a very narrow focus. But it is important to look at those. Other questions that are out there that I think are significant uh, for us are perhaps uh, in some ways another example of describing failed and failing states, but this time with a geographical focus. I would say the Middle East <coughs> from the Pillars of Hercules to the Hindu Kush. The five problem sets that seem in many ways to multiply. Uh, the Arab future or the Arab transformation, I hate to call it Arab Spring because it's become hackneyed and indeed outdated by a combination of time and reality. Uh, but it is important uh, and perhaps one of the most significant and the pieces inside that are very significant. The future of Egypt, indeed what to do about Syria, remain only the two most prominent today. We certainly know that Libya is not yet a successfully transformed state and there will be many more in Yemen and so on. Uh, the other are the three I-word problems, uh, not the three places where New York politicians have to go to succeed, uh, but the three I-word problems in the Middle East, Israel and Palestine and its neighbors, Iraq and Iran. And each of them has an enormously difficult set of issues just to pull out Iran alone, not a failed state, one that we would like to see in greater failing status as a way to try to deal with the nuclear weapons problem, which brings home the notion that in a lot of these questions we will see internal conflicts in where we are going and what we're doing, um, but it has to move ahead. But one where certainly I believe very strongly, and I've been looking at this problem for a long time, where we must exhaust <coughs> all of the possibilities of negotiation and in an election year, we have found that frozen. Uh, nobody in the United States who is standing for election wants to be wimpish in, in the next nine weeks on Iran. And I don't know, but Iran is having an election. I suspect whatever candidate may emerge in, in that somewhat benighted process will not also want to look wimpish until after June of 2013 and the Iranian election once again triumphs in presenting somebody uh, with whom hopefully we can deal a little better than the last time. Uh, but it is important because in a sense the alternatives are so much worse. And the alternatives uh, take you very quickly to the use of force and I want to discuss that somewhat down the line. The other one <coughs> is uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan and I use Pakistan and Afghanistan in that order because I think Pakistan remains a primarily most important problem for the United States. And we're sort of dealing with Afghanistan, not quite yet, but we will be in 2014 on the basis of the old college drinking song. We're here because we're here because we're here. So figure that out. The national justification is now reduced uh, to the problem of presence in many ways. That's an exaggeration, but in my view, it's not too far from where we are. And if we have time, we could certainly discuss some of the reasons important and ephemeral as to why we're in Afghanistan. But Afghanistan, in my view, is also deeply difficult, but not totally unsusceptible to the application of diplomacy. And indeed, we've begun the process. The fact that it's not easy should not necessarily turn us off it. And the fact that negotiation is being pursued means in the fact that we are seeking a legally based set of agreements that will in many ways, if they are successful against all odds, hopefully provide permanence and stability and perhaps some rationality uh, to the future of Afghanistan and in my view help enhance some of the questions of stability in Pakistan. Other issues that are out there, a little more remote from failed and failing states, have to do certainly with weapons of mass destruction and the whole congregate of issues that's related there. There are many uh, legally based and very important sets of questions in the past that have been resolved and certainly, at least now, the emergence out of the closet of obscurity, if not ridiculousness, of thinking about zero nuclear weapons is an important shift in my view and a challenge. Uh, for all of the communities who are dealing with this particular problem, 
and it will obviously, if it is going to move, and certainly there is a long history of nuclear weapons disarmament uh, that makes it very useful to think about this problem in the future in all of its legal context and indeed all of the tradition that's been pulled together. I mentioned the environment and climate change and energy as important questions, and I'll add one more, uh, which is also, I think, at the heart of what we're trying to deal with, which is essentially the fact that we are now operating our government uh, with a 1948 concept based on 19th century and early 20th century ideas. And it isn't easy uh, to see how this can be successfully applied to the 21st century, uh, where the massive tendency is to push everything uh, into today. We have no really yet strong whole of government tradition, nor do we have mechanisms and institutions that can bring people together across the spectrum of activities that have to be dealt with. I'm getting to the end of my time. So let me just raise one question that I hope you will contemplate, but there are many others. War and the use of force. Increasingly, it is my view, particularly since the first Gulf War but beyond, that the international community accepts legitimacy for the use of force in only two contexts, both contained within the church. Article 51 in self-defense, and indeed chapter 7, the authorization of the use of force by the Security Council. Now look at R2P. In my view, a tremendously important other forward step, one that the developing world has been deeply suspicious of because it smacks, obviously, of a new entry card of a kind of collective colonialism in the operation of their own governments and particularly some of the most sensitive internal questions. The fact that a consensus was achievable at high levels at the United Nations some years ago is in my view a step forward. But one of the end results of being affected with R2P, unfortunately in my view, has to be a resort to use of force. And genocide is in my view the defining issue there. Uh, do we, in fact, sit back and permit genocide, or do we go as far as the use of force? And indeed, if the justifications and indeed the legal basis for the use of force is increasingly a Security Council, uh, where one of the five permanent members can block it, uh, then do we have now a, a formula for disaster rather than a recipe for the rule of law being a resounding success? I don't know the answer to that question. We're going to have to battle that out. I'm going to sit down, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you for the invitation to join you this evening. Um, we were asked to reflect on to what extent fragile states are a threat, and I'll do that, but I think we all also must reflect that they're also an opportunity. And in light of the many, many changes that the world has undergone in the last years, one of them we see is the immense demand of the ordinary citizenry um, for rule of law, the demand for rule of law, for inclusion, for participation. I'm going to do three things um, today, um, first set out some questions about what the nature of the crisis is, second reflect on some of the problems in current practice, and then conclude with reflections on some of the opportunities before us. Um, starting with then, what is the nature of the crisis and what's the particular nature of the challenge of fragile states in relation to rule of law? And one of the key challenges is still definitional. How do we measure what a fragile state is? Many of us know one when we see it. You understand the conditions of, of instability and, and crisis, and we can measure it by the, the columns of inches on the, on the front page of the news. Um, my colleagues and I have argued that at the heart of the crisis is something we call a sovereignty gap, or a sovereignty paradox, that our international system is made up of sovereign countries at its, as its constituent elements that we afford de jure legal recognition as sovereign states. But de facto, in practice, can they really be afforded with sovereign legitimacy? And certainly the judgment of millions of their citizens is that many of them don't have 
haven't earned that legitimacy in practice. Um, my, Dr. Ghani and I in our book set out what we thought were the 10 functions that the state must perform in, in the current world, and this was based on interviews with citizens around the world. Um, and we found that rule of law was the most essential of these 10 functions. In fact, we originally we listed it as number 10, but after the American Bar Association had reviewed it, they insisted that it should be number one, and I think they were right, and we accommodated that. So now it's really the forefront, and rule of law is really the foundation and the glue that binds the rest of, of the functions together. What are the others? The traditional barbarian definition um, of the threat of use of force, the monopoly on, on the, the legitimate use of force, there's public finance, the ability to collect and spend, hopefully wisely, with sound management, public finance. M management of the assets of the state, and particularly in fragile states, it's the way that the natural resources are managed that's going to be absolutely <coughs> critical to the stability of that country. How infrastructure service is provided, how's human capital, particularly health and education. The regulation, the rules of the game for the market. Citizenship rights, how are they defined? What, what is the legal definition of a citizen? What are the rules for public borrowing? And you'll see in the way that we've described each of these, rule of law and the way that the rules of the game are set for each of these functions are really integral to the way that they operate. Why are fragile states also an opportunity despite the immense tragedies and, and difficulties um, that they're in at the moment and ahead of them? I think if we look back, it's very easy to be despondent uh, but if we look back at the last 10 years, the last 20 years, 30 years, there are a number of countries that were defined as fragile, that are now well on their way to stability and even in some cases prosperity. Even looking at the World Bank's list of fragile and conflict affected countries, now when I look today, there are at least a dozen that have, over the last decade have moved out of a state of fragility. And I think all too often we don't reflect on these enough to try and understand what made them move from instability to stability and beyond. And some of them, it's Laos, it's Myanmar, Tajikistan, it's Uzbekistan, Cambodia, Cameroon. And we believe that in these societies there are immense lessons that we should, we should take account of. So moving on now to the problems in current pra practice. We think there's been something of a double failure. There's a failure of governments within societies to be legitimate enough to earn the trust of their citizens to perform the functions but there's also been, and if we're honest with ourselves, um, in, some, in many, many cases, a poverty of response. Not all of the interventions have been wisely crafted, not all of the money has been wisely spent. So at the heart of the illegitimacy of government, and we come think that this comes back to the sovereignty paradox. We treat these governments as sovereign, but are they really sovereign? I think we've be, moved beyond a time that trusteeship is acceptable for all sorts of good reasons. Perhaps Kosovo, and East Timor were the last two of the international trusteeships, it remains to be seen. But going forward, I don't think the problem of the sovereignty paradox is going to go away. When we've applied our 10 function framework and our citizens degrade their countries, in many cases, no function gets more than 0 to 1 out of 10. Yet in Kosovo, K4, the military function, was given 10 out of 10 by citizens. So I think this raises real questions about how certain countries are to be managed. And do we need to move towards a kind of conditional sovereignty, or as Stephen Krasner put forward in Unbundled Sovereignty, I think there are a lot of questions for international lawyers to address in the years to come. Um, but it's not only the government that is at times the violator of the rule of law. Many times international responses violate, if they don't violate law, are certainly not adequate to the task. And much has been written on this. And as I reflected on preparing these remarks, I wondered whether the 3D concept hasn't perhaps partly misled us. Um, defense and diplomacy are easily understood, but in bundling everything else into development, I think has led us to put far too much of a burden on USAID and not to look to the more variegated and the, the other tools that perhaps a concept like Dimefill um, that also looks to information, to intelligence, to finance, to law, and to economics which are all very distinct, and not all of them can be marriage, managed by the organization of USAID. And I think I would encourage, and certainly in my own work, I'll be looking much more to dimefill than to the 3Ds um, for the kind of responses that we need. Um, where, so 
where are some of the problems laying? I think the security sector reform has been too narrowly cast, often thinking that just in building armies can security be provided, and not enough focus on the rule of law dimension, or the integration of way that armies are built, police forces, intelligence services, criminal justice systems, and how those fit within a law, rule of law framework. All too often rule of law projects have focused just on the building of the court system, and not enough on are the rules of of the game the right ones and how should legal law reform take place. And I think too much focus, and especially within the development paradigm, has been put on spending money, on spending very large sums of money on contractors, without really realising that the rules themselves are the resources. And when I put this particularly to um, young lieutenants and captains who've been out in the field and in Afghanistan or up, they know exactly what you mean because they understand that the rules are actually far more valuable than the actual money. Without the rules, you can't spend the money. You certainly can't spend the money wisely. Two examples of this in Afghanistan, um, setting up the telecom sector. Initially, the UN said to set up the telecom sector, what you need to do is give Ericsson $100 million and they'll give free phones to all the ambassadors and they can make free calls for life. But no, that wasn't the way the, the, the telecom sector was set up because somebody said, we're not going to pay the phone companies, they're going to pay us if we set the right tender process in motion. That we, the money can be released from the system. There's enough money in the system, but it's the rules of the game that are missing. Um, and they were right, there are now 15 million phones, it's generated billions of dollars in revenue, and it was a question of designing the right tender process. And there is other examples, a program called National Solidarity Program, a block grant given to 28,000 villages, but a very small block grant because the rules were right at the village level, released many times over that amount in terms of the value of projects and participation that was released. Um, so what are some of the questions? I think all too often rule of law projects rush to judicial reform, but need to take a step back. What is the framework of rules already in a society? The constitution, the primary legislation, secondary legislation. How are the rules applied? So that's the judicial system. But also looking beyond that to for the ordinary people of the country. And, and somebody, a civil, civic leader from the south of Afghanistan once put it to me, he said, to, to understand our society, you have to understand we're like any other country. We have 4% thugs, we have 1% extremists, and 95% ordinary people. And he said, you forget the ordinary people at your peril. And so for the ordinary people, how do they experience rule of law? Can they access justice? And how do they experience fairness? And we hear again and again with interviews with citizens, it's not so much a particular application of law, but it's whether there's justice and fairness in the administration of, of justice. Um, so, and how does the state relate to the citizens? Do they experience the state or the government as abuse and exclusion, or do they relate to it as, as protection of their, of their basic rights? And as we look at the 10 functions of the state, we find very much that it's the question of those rules of the game and how those functions are administered that are really the key test for those citizens. Um, in closing, I just wanted to raise a, a few issues. Um, for the national security strategy, I think there's an immense opportunity to reaffirm the centrality of the rule of law approach. And it reflects a demand for justice and fairness, which I think is what the 95% have in common with the American people and the interests of the US and its government and its people. And it's the demand for justice and fairness which is also reflected in the spirit in the letter of the UN Charter that gives an immense opportunity for different types of partnerships in rebuilding and helping fragile states to move to a different condition. Um, I think it requires, as I, as I mentioned earlier, far greater examination of when we engage in security sector reform of the interlinkages between building armies, police forces, criminal justice systems, and looking much more to the civilian, the rule of law framework in which those are embedded. And I think it requires a much greater focus on the pragmatic question of the how-to. If we're to work effectively on rule of law programs, is it sufficient, as I understood happened in some of the transitional former Soviet Union countries, to import laws from outside? Or do we need to, in the current age, work much more carefully to build on the laws and the systems that are already there. We read again and again in the World Bank and UN reports that there's a blank slate, there's nothing there, we have to start from scratch. And of course it only takes a few days 
of sitting, whether it's in South Sudan or Nepal, to understand that there's a very rich judicial and legal tradition. Um, and judges and jurists with an immense, immense experience over decades of applying the laws, and that those probably provide a very sound foundation to build on rather than bringing laws from outside. I once had a, a wonderful conversation with a Harvard professor who'd been brought in to reform the tax code of Afghanistan. And he was, he was just about to leave. And he went and he dropped by um, to talk to the Ministry of Justice and said, well, of course you're going to pass my law on Monday in the cabinet. And they roared with laughter and said, no, we're not. And he said, well, why not? I thought we'd all agreed this. And he, they said, well, you wrote us a very like, nice law, but you didn't ask us if we already had one. <laughs> and we do, and here it is. And we can make ours match yours just with one small amendment, and this is how we could do it. And he just caught that in time, but it, he said after that conversation, it was completely going to change the way that he approached next time he works in a country, he said. He was going to ask what laws they already have uh, before enforcing his own. And I think questions for perhaps this group and, and ones that I'd ask is, you know, is it time for a really new and reinvigorated project of rule of law, engagement in rule of law issues? Um, really, well, more of a plea to, to increase and amplify what you already do, given the centrality of the issue. Um, the second is, is to have very um, urgent, I think, exploration of what do we mean and what do we do about the sovereignty paradox or the sovereignty gap. Um, are there gaps in international law, or what kind of responses in international regimes could we arrive at? Um, and then how do we, when, when we do engage, how can we carry that act of engaging and advising out more sensitively, sensitively so that we build on what's already there rather than importing the new? Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm going to come sort of midway between what Tom talked about and what, uh, what Claire talked about. And I also want to spend a little bit of time focusing on the, uh, what the Department of Defense thinks about as it engages in these sets of issues. So I'll use some of the examples that Tom used. The, the list I made is overlapping but not quite the same. I'm going to leave the economic issues off. He's right, they're tremendously important. I'm going to leave uh, ideological issues off, although they overlap, uh, and we face some enormous challenges both in the Middle East and, for that matter, in, in Asia. Uh, so the questions I want to look at uh, include China, uh, UN tech questions like drone attacks or Iran, uh, cyber, uh, Afghanistan, and as we think about these questions, I'd ask you to have in your mind maybe four concepts which relate to the rule of law. Is there a framework out there, or do we need to develop a framework, a legal framework, and how does that apply to this particular circumstance? What happens when we have the intersection of competing principles? Each principle in and of itself makes good sense, but they really clash, and I'll try to give you some examples of that. What about the problems of creation, when there really isn't a whole lot of law, or maybe not even any at all to start with, and you really have to build it up? And lastly, as Claire alluded to, what about the problems of culture? Uh, how do you deal with Western views of law in circumstances where it's not a Western culture? So those four, if you would hold in your mind, I think permeate throughout. And when the DOD gets involved and has to think about these kinds of questions, uh, it, it first is, is not important to say, uh, that the first framework for the Department of Defense is the domestic framework. We have a lot of laws that constrain the United States military. They're in Title 10, in Title 50, and the like, and the military applies those, adheres to those. Uh, there's a broader uh, set of laws which also apply. They're integrated uh, under the UN, under the laws of war, and the like. Um, and we ask ourselves, you know, how do those apply? So, for example, uh, if we are in a war-type situation, all military people will know that things like military necessity, principles of distinction, proportionality apply, at least in general, and then they'll ask themselves, what, what does that actually 
uh, mean in a context. And they will also have what they call rules of engagement, which really are policy decisions framed mostly by policy but partly by law. And one of the interesting things that happens when you take all these things together that the DOD has to apply, one of the greatest strengths that we have, and we say it regularly, are our allies and partners. Well, it turns out that even our closest allies and partners have different concepts. They have different domestic rules that apply to their military. They have different views as to what the law of armed conflict means. They have different rules of engagement. So, for example, the British are much <coughs> more strict with respect to when you can return fire. And in fact, as some of you may know, a number of British uh, military personnel have been actually tried, found, indicted by grand juries and tried for things that we would never actually think uh, deserve that kind of activity. And a few have even been uh, convicted. Um, that means that when they're working with us, they have to consider things that we don't have to consider and it makes it much harder for the militaries to work together. The international uh, frameworks, the UN Charter and like Tom alluded to, Claire alluded to, uh, you know, right of self-defense, for sure. Uh, the UN Council, uh, Security Council Authority are the two you know, main, main sets of questions. Um, but there are broader additional frameworks, and one, for example, is the law of the sea. Um, most countries in the world have adopted the law of the sea. You know, explicitly, the United States adheres to it, although we are not a signatory. That's a, that's a story that uh, could be told at length. But the interesting thing about the fact that you have the law of the sea framework is that it turns out not to actually solve a whole lot of problems in and of itself. I and mean, that's not a big surprise to litigators who know that there are always two sides to the story. But, for example, in the South China Sea, um, there are a number of competing claims, all the countries claiming that they have a certain amount of rights with respect to their exclusive economic zones, as roughly speaking, uh, go 200 miles offshore or to any territory that they own, which is why we have a lot of people claiming to own rocks. Um, because if you own the rock, you get the 200 miles around. Now, here we have, in addition, uh, the Chinese bringing forward another legal justification. They say that, look, we got a lot of maps historically. You know, we've owned this stuff forever. Let me show you this map from 1496 or something like that. What happens here is we have competing legal claims, which are really ways to put forward competing policy claims, and there's no method of adjudication. So one has to work very hard at the set of issues that Tom alluded to, this is where the role of diplomacy really should shine. And the United States is working hard to make it shine. We've, you've all heard, I think, about the value of having a code of conduct. Um, perhaps that can be agreed to, perhaps not. Um, but it's something where one has to actually, even though there's a framework, you know, create, create something else. In addition, I like the military. Uh, I worked there many, you know, for many, many years. <clears throat> Tom talked about the issue of leverage. One of the ways you have leverage is to have some capability in the military arena. Uh, the Chinese are recognizing this. They're building up their forces. A lot of the countries in the region have reached out to the United States, some subtly, some not so subtly, saying, we really want you to back us up. One not so subtle way is when they say, under the treaty, mutual defense treaty that you have signed with us, whether it's the Philippines or Japan, that set of rocks are covered by the treaty. And so if somebody is fooling around with them, you are obligated to come to our defense. Now, the United States adheres to all treaties, uh, but I think we are yet still in the diplomatic approach to trying to resolve these questions, uh, rather than focusing heavily on the, on the military approach but making sure that the military is enough in the background, visible enough in the background, that there is the leverage that Tom talked about. <coughs> the second area uh, uh, beyond frameworks is this issue of intersection of principles. And I think this comes uh, to the fore pretty clearly with respect to both the drone attacks and, and maybe with respect to Iran. So for example, um, in Yemen, uh, the newspapers say, at least, that the United States has conducted drone attacks, and they say uh, that they are done with the agreement of the government. Um, 
There are a lot of questions that have been raised as to whether or not this is appropriate or not. The National Security Advisor has given a very good speech about this as to the United States rationale. So you have, on the one hand, the issues of sovereignty, the issues of the rights of American citizens, as was raised in one issue, and on the other hand, the issue of imminent threat. And both those sets of principles, or, or all three sets really, are strong principles, but they don't lead you to an absolute conclusion. Again, litigators, lawyers understand this. You can each, everyone wants to own the controlling principle. Here, as is often true in the international arena, there are multiple significant high-level principles that conflict, and the, uh, the art for the policymaker is to bring those to some fruitful, fruitful conclusion. Uh, you may have the same set of issues in a place like Somalia or other places where there really is no government. Uh, where, as Claire said, you know, sovereignty may exist in theory but doesn't really exist in fact, and how do you deal with that? And the Iran issue raises another uh, important set of questions with respect to principles. Everyone agrees, in broad terms, to the UN Charter. But what happens when the Security Council can't agree, and yet there is an imminent threat, at least as defined by one of the nations? The self-defense principle, how does that come into play? How do the Israelis have legitimacy on their side? This morning we heard a lot about their prime minister's uh, speech about red lines and the like. Uh, we'll see what happens there. Um, is an imminent threat for Israel different in terms of time than, say, an imminent threat for the United States? Because it's a smaller country, because there have been a lot more statements made, right, terrifying and despicable statements made about Israel by members of the Iranian government. How does imminent threat really get decided? And when can you really go forward without Security Council approval, uh, especially when you know that some of the members of the Security Council are not only not approving, but they're in fact disapproving? So what, what's the role there? The fourth area uh, is this issue of creation. There are a lot of places, Tom alluded to this, the world is changing a lot. Cyber is a classic example. <coughs> it's an area in which there are some laws, some domestic laws. There's even an, one international convention, the so-called Brussels Convention, with respect to crime, cybercrime. Uh, but there's not a whole lot of law uh, with respect to what you do about espionage. There's not a whole lot of law about what happens if there are attacks or threatened attacks on highly critical infrastructure, which either could create a conflict or could escalate a conflict. How does one deal with all those questions? And how do you work forward to create an approach where you're really trying to build up the law, not just utilize it. It doesn't really exist. So you can say to yourself, well, as someone said, we have common interests, maybe even with an adversary. China has been public, publicly identified uh, by the United States in a, a, a unclassified report as a source of a lot of cyber attacks. Do we have anything in common with the Chinese? Can we work with them? Well, maybe we can with respect to criminal activities, even though we can't work with respect to espionage. Maybe yes, maybe no, maybe that's the way to look at things. Maybe countries, like-minded countries, could create a common domestic approach, even if they can't agree on a treaty. Uh, maybe we need to create new institutions. I've written elsewhere that uh, there is in the financial world uh, what's called the Financial Stability Board, uh, which deals with the banking and other financial institutions and countries the so-called Basel agreements, and countries adhere to this, and then they come home, and they put into play uh, domestic legislation and regulations under an agreed framework. <coughs> we should have an agreed framework for cyber, or cyber stability board, and start with eight or 10 countries, US, UK, Australia, Japan, perhaps, I'll look at Korea, you can add France, Germany, whatever, uh, who could conceivably agree, create a small framework, get that started, and then see if it can be expanded. Maybe yes, maybe no. But there is a place for new legal institutions that would allow for appropriate policies to be generated. The last point, and let me sort of close with the, with the fragile states. Um, as Claire pointed out, it's not always clear what a fragile state is. Now, if we mean a very you know, underdeveloped, uh, low economic uh, circumstance, then I think we could probably pick out a lot of them. But if you mean fragile in the sense that, well, it could lead to a lot of instability, uh, then sometimes some more advanced states uh, might really be deemed fragile. 
Um, and so how do you really work and think that through? Looking at, and as Tom said appropriately, the Pakistan-Afghanistan set of problems, uh, those, you can see that there are issues again of sovereignty versus uh, imminent threat and self-defense. Uh, the United States, again, according to uh, newspapers and maybe more than that, depending on what the administration did or did not say, uh, apparently conducts drone attacks uh, from Afghanistan into Pakistan. Um, Pakistanis, at least ostensibly checked, maybe <coughs> um, How does the rule of law really apply? Should we be even thinking about it, or is it just all fake? Um, just a dance that one has to go through. Well, I think if one looks at public opinion in Pakistan, it's not just a dance. On the other hand, if one looks at what the governments are doing, the military of Pakistan, the senior people in the government, you know, maybe it is. Um, who's kidding whom? I'm not sure. On the other hand, again, according to newspaper reports, uh, the number two person in one of the significant, uh, if you will, terrorist organizations just recently killed, okay, they just confirmed that. And it's probably something that's positive, uh, but not probably. If it happened, then it's certainly positive from the US, U.S. point of view. Um, so you have that set of issues, but you also have the issue of creating some kind of framework, understanding exactly, as Claire said, that there really aren't any vacuums. There may be things you want to change. That really could be true. But you don't go into a country finding a vacuum. The people there exist and live. Uh, for Americans who haven't traveled uh, abroad much, one of the comments that comes back regularly is, they're just like us. Well, that's not quite true, actually. But it is true that they're people. You know, they love their children. You know, they have to have a job of some sort and the like. You know, they want to do better normally. And they are like <coughs> us now. The culture may be quite different, however. And it's the mirror imaging that sometimes gets us in a great deal of difficulty. Or when we forget. Uh, as the Harvard professor, and I'm a graduate of a different school at Harvard, so I'm certainly not denigrated a Harvard professor. Uh, <coughs> but when he forgets to ask, did you have a law? I mean, pretty stupid, right? <laughs> no. So how do you work, however, across cultures, and what principles do we have to adhere to as we try to cause things to happen, and how much do you accept the local culture? Because normally, uh, at least in a counterinsurgency situation or some other circumstance like that, we wouldn't be there if everything was just okay. We wouldn't be there if it was a stable situation. Uh, we're there because it's normally, at least, it's usually significantly unstable. And that implies that the local circumstances are not working as well as even the 95% would like, but how to fix it is much more, much more difficult. So one has to think about, well, what would the people like? And you could say to yourself, well, they'd like swift justice, as Claire said. They'd probably like not much corruption, or at least uh, I used to call it Chicago corruption. I don't know what I've got more, but you know, there's Chinese corruption, where a whole lot of corruption you've seen, <coughs> but the roads get built, the infrastructure gets built. So then what I call Congo corruption, where all that money goes to the Cayman Islands or uh, Switzerland, and you know, the people get nothing. Um, at a minimum, you want to have a productive society at some level. Well, we know that, but then how do you actually take those set of principles and say, all right, but here's what I need to do, be it in Afghanistan or someplace in Africa or other places in the Middle East or wherever. Um, those are not, not easy issues. So there is, I think, a tremendous amount of thinking to be done uh, by international lawyers, but I don't think it amounts to cut and paste. I don't think that, you know, word is really the way to do it. I do think that what one has to do is go back and say to oneself, all right, is there a framework and how far will the framework get me? Uh, when I have conflicting principles, how am I thinking about resolving those? Whether it's practically or through some system or the like, do I, when I create law, do I need to create new institutions? How do I take into account the culture of the place that I'm trying to work in? All those are the issues that are really the ones that I think are in the future for us. I think they apply across the board. They certainly apply in fragile states, but I think they apply more than that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
going to proceed to questions now, but I'm going to uh, take the prerogative of moderator and ask the first question. And this question is directed to all three panelists. We are observing a changing model of national security policy in relation to rule of law at this time in the US government with a greater emphasis on prevention of conflict, on mediation and reconciliation, and less on state building and reconstruction. Less on the comprehensive establishment of a justice system on eradicating corruption and instead leaving these to local elements. What are your thoughts on the direction of the future given this? And I did not prep the panelists for this question in advance. I think they're a natural evolution of the notion that on the one hand, the United States cannot do everything. Secondly, to have buy-in, you have to have local commitment. Thirdly, cultural differences mean that one size doesn't fit all. That thirdly, radical change is not achieved overnight by foreign imposition. And fourthly, with due respect, the United States is probably declining in its influence as a single actor, but it needs to go back particularly to some of the ideas in the Cold War period where it was felt very useful to employ a great deal of your diplomacy uh, in a multilateral context, even if it was an ad hoc multilateral context, in building support for and creating a nexus of cooperation around a set of ideas in which parties contributed as opposed necessarily to the full-blown view. I suppose historically one could say that the combination of the end of the Cold War, some of the hubris which briefly surrounded something called the New World Order, which smacked of a certain totalitarian history, and a notion in the end that it wasn't all going to work out precisely the way we wanted, and that the diplomacy got harder rather than easier, led us <coughs> to see that we could perhaps move toward imposed solution rather than sold solutions. But I think what you say is realistic. And it represents an ability to accommodate to a reality necessarily, uh, even though, in fact, one doesn't have to give up principles, uh, even if one has to accommodate to realities for a time. And that has the longer process and the more carefully worked out process sometimes has a greater degree of success over a period of time and that instant coffee is not the answer to all questions. Uh, powder it and add hot water and you get the answer is not the answer to all these kinds of questions. But it means in fact that we have to be in for the longer haul. It means in fact that we have to think a great deal more about how to deal with the complexities of the, of the issue. Um, and we have to believe and understand that uh, we don't have perfection in all the solutions and maybe other folks can do it in a way that it may not meet all of our standards right away but can move the question ahead. Uh, there are lots of small countries, lots of new countries, lots of countries that are struggling um, and we ourselves are struggling. If Guantanamo were a model for perfection, everybody else would have it. Uh, if detention without trial on a permanent basis of even selected people who perhaps might be disguised as prisoners of war for a brief period of time is the answer, we would have a lot more people who would follow us. So I think we have to look first at ourselves and as well at the problems of working in a world uh, where instant coffee is not going to be available to you as ways of going ahead. And so I think, secondly, what you say is perhaps a council of reality. Thank you. Claire? I think the renewed emphasis on diplomacy is, is welcome and overdue. And it is clearly apparent, and should have been long ago, that neither reliance on, on brute force or use of force, um, nor on billion, billion dollar beltway contracts um, are going to achieve stability. Um, I think if we define state building as top down and implemented by billion dollar public contracts, no, it's not going to work, and clearly it doesn't. 
however, to ignore the demands of citizens for institutions that work for them, I think is a perilous shortcut which will have severe and costly long-term consequences. Um, and I think it really matters what type of diplomacy we're talking about. If it's the cut, cutting of very short-term expedient deals, um, precisely because in many societies the institutions are so weak, then they won't last. Um, if the Co Paul Collier's statistics are, are, are very famous, and I, I don't know if he's updated them recently, but certainly they were about half of all peace agreements fall back into conflict and then run the cost. And, and we know that dealing with conflict after it's broken out is much, much more costly than preventing it. Uh, my colleagues and I at ISC reviewed the peace agreements of the last two decades and were enormously fortunate to be able to interview the UN Secretary, Special Representative of the Secretary Generals who mediated and implemented those peace deals. And we asked them what their biggest regret was. And all of them said their biggest regret was to forget about economics. So very much echoing Ambassador Pickering. They said, we thought economics was something that could wait for 10 years until the peace and stability was established. But we realized that we, couldn't, we didn't have the revenue to pay for the things we promised in the peace agreement. Young men didn't have jobs and so took up arms. And it wasn't as though the economy waited. A criminal economy came into being or persisted which poisoned the politics and tipped us back to civil war. So if we ignore the economics, the institutions, we end up back with the conflict and having to do, again, this cycle of expediency. So I think the real challenge is, is how to combine the two um, and how, you know, obviously that the multi-billion dollar contracts are, are unaffordable but we're always ill-advised. But is there a different method of combining the peacemaking with the institution building in, in smarter ways going forward. And I do think, as I said, I do think the lessons exist. There have been some examples of success. Um, concluding point on this, I also think that we're missing something very, very important that Bob Hormatz has, has, is leading an initiative on, which is called domestic financing for development. Instead of thinking that it's got to be US taxpayers giving their money through USAID and others to big contracts, Many, many of the societies, if not most, have extraordinary riches within their societies. They only spend a tiny fraction of their own budgets every year, because they can't spend their money, again, because of the procurement rules, the rules as the constraint, but also the, the natural resources and so on have great potential. So I think moving towards a model where countries pay for their own development is, is one that we've got to move forward, which will bring down the cost radically. Right. I think uh, prevention is a great idea, but I also think we need to focus on whether we really know how to do it. Mm -hmm. um, no question that it's much better to prevent than have a conflict. That's easy. Uh, any military person will tell you that. Any person that's engaged mm -hmm. and got caught in a conflict will tell you that. Whether we have the capabilities to really prevent is uncertain, and the, the paradigm that that sentence is put towards is not particularly clear to me either. Um, are we really talking about very weak states that are about to crumble and therefore cause problems for the citizens? Are we talking about nation state conflicts and the like? Um, are we going to be able to prevent problems in the South China Sea to use an example? Uh, one hopes so. Um, and there's an awful lot of diplomacy going on, but it's an open, open question. What does it mean to, to prevent the problem? So I think we really need to recognize that it's harder to do uh, than it looks. And, and since that, that, I'm pretty sure that was from the Secretary Clinton's QDDR, um, since that was written, we've had things like Libya, we've had the problems in the Sahel, we've had Syria, we've had Bahrain, all places where the prevention model hasn't worked, which is not to say it's not a good idea, it's not my point at all. My point is that we really have to focus on the methodologies of how to actually do it. Uh, Claire's work over the last uh, eight to 10 years, uh, some with Ashraf Ghani, some on our own, some work that other of us have done, uh, all trying to figure that out. But I think we would say that we don't yet really have, or I would say we don't yet really have a good systematic approach. Uh, we know some things that haven't worked, um, but we don't know yet what will work. And I think we're really in early days. Now, I, I like the approach, but again, I would call on, if you will, the international lawyer rule of law crowd as one part. The economics may be another part, the diplomatic is another part, 
in my opinion, the appropriate use of the military is another part. Um, and talking about new structures, I think, is something that one has to think about. Uh, it's not always the case that, if you will, uh, the Holy Roman Empire existed for a long time, but it was pretty atrophied by the end, right? Um, and it finally fell by the wayside. Uh, there may be things that are approaching Holy Roman Empire status, neither Holy nor Roman nor Empire, right? Um, there are some new institutions that have been created in the last few years. There's something called the Arctic Council, uh, which I forget exactly. It has seven to nine countries bordering on the Arctic who are now talking about the problems, both environmental, uh, if you will, a sovereignty type problems, uh, exploitation of resources in that particular area. Um, getting together and having a conversation, I think, is absolutely the right way to go. It's the best use of diplomacy. And by that, I mean diplomacy with broad as Tom has already defined. And that kind of thing, I think, could really um, be invaluable. And I think we really do have to take a look at both our institutions and our methodologies in order to make the sentences that Milan talked about be a reality rather than just an explanation. Could I just say, I think Frank may be a little more dismal. I think it has tended to work pretty well in small places where early action can be taken. Uh, Peru, Ecuador years ago, Macedonia. And you could go on and see a number of places. In some places it hasn't worked perfectly, but some of the examples you gave, there's a sense of stability while there's still an overhang of the potential for conflict breaking out again, so it hasn't been 100%. Um, but I think we've learned something. One of the things we've learned is that for big issues uh, which involve significant engagement, early uh, motivation to act is deterred by costs, by political problems, and indeed by the lack of support in the world community. Uh, and. Unfortunately, the U.S. tradition of wanting to be the leader over the last 50 years has sort of meant that people who don't want to do things constantly wait for us to take the lead. Uh, and it's becoming increasingly difficult, as I think Milan's first question indicated, for us to jump up to the bar. Thank you very much. Now, let's, let's take some questions from the audience. Please. Um, Oh, and please, please introduce yourself and then state your question. Thank sure. You. Uh, my name is Alka Pradhan. I'm uh, counsel of the Task Force on Detainee Treatment uh, with the Constitution Project. Um, I, well, thank you for your remarks. They were very, uh, they were very, very interesting and food for thought. Um, my question is about non-state actors. Uh, the rule of law, existing rule of law, is traditionally state-centric. Um, the UN Charter, the, the international covenants, etc. And my question is, how does one promote the rule of law in fragile states when non-state actors are increasingly larger players in fragile states, whether, uh, whether creating instability or working for change? I have a, a couple of thoughts, uh, Alka, and I think that um, there have been examples. For example, um, three or four of the most recent treaties, many of which have gotten a burr under America's saddle, have in fact been uh, pretty much the work of the non-state actor community, the NGO community. Certainly landmines, small arms, uh, ICC are among those. Uh, and to some extent, they have made a major contribution to the corpus of international law, even though in some cases I think if we had spent more time with the non-governmental organization community, we could have probably gotten a deal that came closer and closer to meeting some of our needs uh, in the places where American exceptionalism uh, was sort of saddled uh, to the problem as a whole. Certainly, uh, the landmine belt in Korea, which has been a major impediment uh, to us accepting uh, that particular convention, I think something could have been worked out. I, I still think something can be worked out with respect to the International Criminal Court, in which America's policy uh, to always take action with respect to charges against Americans, or the, or the possibility of charges against Americans, is the perfect answer uh, to the issue of how to reconcile ourselves with the ICC. 
Uh, but it means, in fact, that we have to use the opportunities in the treaty and maybe get agreements about how to do that uh, that will provide uh, a, a way of proceeding. Uh, and that I think we need to get our friends in the Pentagon to think about that, and that in fact uh, it will require not just taking action in the ones we choose to take action, but an investigative arrangement which is prepared to be comprehensive and to convince the rest of the world that we are serious in using our legal system uh, to do that. But I won't go into that further, but I do think that in many ways uh, we have had a tendency in the State Department to work with the NGOs only that section of the department which shares an interest with the NGO. But even there, it's been a progenitor of change and, and the source of a lot of interesting ideas. I have always thought that organizationally, uh, the State Department has one bureau that relates to the Congress, but indeed the whole department substantively relates to the Congress. Uh, my sense would be that it might be useful to have a bureau that relates to the NGO community in a general sense and is able to mobilize the totality of the department to deal with the substantive issues of concern rather than just to leave it in a hit, hit or miss basis. We could perhaps know better what's on their minds and we could respond better to what's on their minds if that were the case and they would not be, put it this way, bound to the stovepipes of the State Department necessarily. Thank you. Other questions please? Yes. Hi, my name is Amanda Batista and I'm from um, American University. My question to you is, the, in the panel you have mentioned the, the importance of um, smart diplomacy as well as the new opportunities that are coming in transi transitioning states such as Egypt and the Middle East. Um, using a case study of Egypt, who a country that has recently come out of autocratic rule to a democratic government that is looking to promote transparency as well as fairness to its people. Um, how do we capitalize on this opportunity in a state such as Egypt to promote um, stability in the East um, with economic diplomacy or investments in that? And, and for maybe a quick comment on the previous question, I just wanted to make a, a, an observation about those, those non-state actors working for positive change. And, and without I mean, absolute recognition of the tremendous work and, and contribution that they do, I do think there's a very serious issue of conflict of laws. Um, and we see this in many, many countries. I think where NGOs are doing advocacy work and accountability, citizenship accountability work, that's one thing. But there are now NGOs that have become industrial in scale and are really substituting for the state. They're carrying out health, health education, agriculture mm -hmm. services and have become, in my view, despite the great work they do, despite the great individuals, an enormous investment <coughs> to governance. And one has to read, there's a great report that actually predated the tragic earthquake in Haiti called Why Foreign Aid to Haiti Failed by the US um, Academy of Public Administration. Mm -hmm which documents this syndrome and makes the case, yes, there's been corruption on the government side, but even a non-corrupt government couldn't have handled this, these thousands of NGOs operating as, as actors. So I think that, that's a serious problem that does need um, addressing. Essentially, the NGOs turn up and say, we, we've got the money, we've been told to do this. The, the, the minister will say, but we've got these laws, and they, the NGO will say, we don't care. And that needs some reconciling. And I think that given that so many of them rely on U the US government for their contracts, that's something that the US needs to address as an urgent rule of law issue. The rule of law as long as it's our rule. Yes, <laughs> and it trumps their rule. <laughs> but we want to build that, that rule. I think it needs, that needs some, some working out still. Um, on, on the question of, of Egypt, I think how do we, I'm not sure it's going to be we and, and you know how well you know how many programs and how, how much is up to the US versus and it's really now an internal Egyptian issue but to the extent there's engagement and I think the, um, the the economic track is certainly one that Secretary Clinton I think very rightly emphasized 
and actually moved away from a model of US contracting to one which was much more based on economic engagement, which I think was exactly right, and using instruments like OPIC, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, and risk guarantees, and the EBRD, and so on. So I think the, um, that, that was the, the, exactly the right kind of framing. It's, it's not sufficient. Um, it doesn't deal with the civilian, the citizenship, the accountability issues, the rule of law issues, but in terms of working on revitalizing the economy, which is one of the key sources of grievance for, for the population, um, I think that, that the State Department has turned to the right kind of instruments and, and that has the right kind of framing. Unfortunately, it came, tragically, it came just at the time of the international sort of financial crisis, but those kind of instruments that rely on risk guarantees and private sector investments are at much lower cost to, to US taxpayers. Can I just yes, I think it would be fair to say that <coughs> a better place to start is to recognize that the Egyptians are still in the midst of an ongoing, I'll use the word revolution, um, and they're going to mostly be in control. And what we are going to do is, is pretty much at the margins, which doesn't make it unimportant, but we are not going to control what they decide to do. Uh, just as a, an example, uh, their uh, recently elected president went uh, to the uh, uh, conference of the Nine Line Movement. Uh, we were not sure what was going to happen. Interestingly enough, uh, some of the things that he turned out to say, especially with respect to Syria, were very much along the lines of the United States' life. Uh, we would have preferred him probably not to have gone to, because it gave credence to the uh, Iranian regime. Um, but it's an example that they're going to be in charge themselves. Uh, secondly, with respect to the economic side, I think that's right. I, th I think Claire's point, or at least the, the, the Secretary's, in any way my point, uh, is that American aid really is going to be a small amount. Uh, so the trick is to get the Egyptians creating their own capabilities. Uh, it's a large country. Um, they have the capacity, if done right, to actually generate internal investment um, and then to use that for trade and other kinds of issues. There is also an issue of uh, American military aid, which has gone on for many, many years, uh, which came out of the original uh, Camp David agreements, of course, and has a whole lot to do uh, with respect to the uh, treaty between Israel and Egypt, um, peace treaty, and how that goes forward. The place of the Egyptian military in the new Egyptian world is to be determined. Um, and I think what you see the United States government doing at the moment is not making any dramatic moves while the Egyptians themselves sort this out. From an analytic military point of view, the Egyptians don't need all that money. They don't really have a major threat. Um, from a political point of view and maintaining appropriate relations with the important institution in Egypt that had been important and maybe still is, and I think what you're seeing is this administration, and whether it's the president has a second amendment, term or, or uh, you know, uh, Mr. Romney gets the term, I think you're going to still see that kind of caution because we don't really know what the factors are going to turn out to be in Egypt, or at least I don't. I would just add a couple of points. I think that both Claire and Frank have pointed out the necessity of the United States to accommodate the circumstances, and I think that that's been well <coughs> done in general, particularly on the economic side. I think we have, uh, in a sense, a result in Egypt uh, where the SCAF uh, is now somewhat marginalized, but not out of the picture, but where it presents, in a sense, a military alternative to us, which is certainly not Mubarak, but it's not what we stand for. Uh, the Ikhwana Muslimin, the, the uh, Muslim Brotherhood, is also a very difficult question, because if you examine their literature and you see what their objective of, the objective is the Islamization of uh, Egyptian society and government. And that's certainly not there, but we don't have a choice. I think that in general we have done things well. I think the notion of standing back, letting local forces work, building where we can, taking targets of opportunity, understanding our limitations. I'm a little bit aghast at why we suddenly got out on a limb to tell the Egyptians where they could go and where they couldn't go. As members of the non-aligned, totally mesmerized by the Iranian equation when in the end we lost we therefore bolstered the Iranians and their feeling of having won. And if we had quietly gone to President Morsi and said, look, it's your choice, we'd rather you not go, but we understand, 
But when you go, would you pay attention, as he did happily, to the issues that are of concern to us? I think we've been a lot better off. And in, in the end, we ended up making the non-aligned summit much more prominent than it should have been. We tried to tell the Secretary General of the United Nations what he should do. After all, 120 member states were represented there. He shouldn't go. I mean, are we out of our minds? Do we think that, in effect, the Secretary General of the United States is going to be the Secretary General for, of the United Nations, going to be Secretary General of the United States and ignore the rest of the members of the organization? But we should use with him the kind of creative things that could be done. And he, too, spoke out. I think usefully, and, and you know, maybe that was the, the nasty American pressure against it, but we could have gotten the same result with having, without having lost the battle, if I could put it that way. Thank you. Yes, please. My name is Mubeen Rana. I'm from the University of London. What I understand from the concept of justice is equality. And uh, with respect to one country, uh, as I'm from Pakistan originally, and uh, uh, Iran as supposing tra imminent threats in the region. So what measures are taken and should be taken in the future so in order to limit uh, the country in order to create in creating risks to the other uh, countries of the region. Could you explain that? Thank you. Well I just want to make sure I understood the question. If, if, is, the question is what can be done to keep Iran and separately Pakistan from creating an imminent threat in the region? Yeah. So one of the uh, obvious things that is being done with respect to Iran is the uh, ongoing negotiations uh, with respect to the uh, nuclear facilities and the uh, apparent drive towards nuclear weapons, which I personally think that is their goal. Um, they may not have made the choice, that's what you read in the newspapers, but they certainly have taken a lot of steps. Um, it would be a good result uh, if the Iranians chose to go down the route that's being offered by the you know, P5 plus 1 type approach. Uh, at the moment, you know, negotiations are very much at a standstill. Uh, sanctions are very much uh, in play. Um, Sanctions have effective economic consequences, but they haven't had geopolitical consequences yet. That's not a big surprise because, you know, it's a two-step process, and they're not. It's not a linear type process. Uh, as Tom, I think earlier said, <coughs> uh, the Iranians also have their own political process, and they're in the midst. Uh, so I think that we are uh, seeing a situation in which uh, what the if you will, negotiators are trying to do is create a circumstance where Iran comes to the conclusion that it's in its own interest to not go forward with the, with the nuclear weapons. Now, that's not the only threat that's perceived by some of the countries in the region. Uh, the Arab countries of the Gulf certainly do not see Iran as a friendly uh, entity all the time, although some of them have very, very, very substantial trade relations. So it's, a, it's more complicated than just a a uh, view of black and white uh, situation. And the United States uh, has said publicly uh, a number of times that Iran supports uh, the multiple uh, terrorist uh, organizations and the like, including and, and adds to the problems uh, in Lebanon and now uh, apparently in Syria. Um, I think what one sees there is that there's just very substantial differences of interest. Uh, I am not sure that all problems can be easily solved. Uh, we've had difficulties with Iran for multiple, multiple reasons since their revolution, since 1979. So I think that this is a problem that one has to manage rather than resolve. Uh, with respect to Pakistan, I think Pakistan's circumstance, the most difficult problem for the Pakistanis, I think, is internal. Uh, it's, it's problems of governance, it's problems of economics, it's a problem of a society that is stratified, uh, some very uh, well off, and some significant amount of middle class, but many, 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 many people who are, are not. Um, and that allows for, I think, a, a great deal of uh, extremist ideology to take hold, and it has taken hold. I think that we have gotten into a situation with respect to Pakistan where it's going to take a long time to. Uh, 
for Pakistan to revitalize itself. Uh, and I think the best thing that can be done is to have a, a great deal of patience where one can. And again, remember that our leverage is not gigantic. Uh, Pakistan is a very big country. I have the track exactly, but it's about 150 to 160 million people. That's a lot of people. Um, and they have their own sets of issues. Balochistan is, you know, one set back and forth with Afghanistan. And obviously, from a Pakistani national security point of view, and the military, which is very important, still sees the, the India set of problems as, as quite consequential, although there are some steps along those lines. So from, from my perspective, from the United States perspective, I think one has to take a, take a long-term view and say, all right, what can we do that might make some concrete, positive approaches, but we're not going to get a solution in a year or two years three years. It's taken 25 years to get into this very, very difficult situation. It may take a long time to get out. So that's, um, I don't know if that's hopeful or dismal, um, according to Tom's calculation, uh, but I think it's realistic that one has to, with both respect to both of those situations, expect to manage, not necessarily have a tremendously clear end. Thank you. Um, a quick comment on, on Pakistan, and largely to echo Frank's excellent analysis, um, I think as we've heard a number of leading Pakistani figures say the, the key issues for Pakistan are the internal socioeconomic challenges, and everyone from Maliha Lodi who will state this in, in her recent book um, to the Planning Commission has just come out with a, a, a wonderful strategy which asks the question, you know, the, what are 100, the 100 million young people coming onto the jobs market in Pakistan, what future do they have? And I think that means exactly taking a, this is a, a generational challenge for Pakistan. And the best thing that the US can do, instead of rushing in, solving problems at the margin with its own aid, is to stand back and reiterate the question that Pakistan's own citizens are asking, which is how does Pakistan itself, with its incredible potential, you know, just a few years ago, Pakistan was named as, by Goldman Sachs as one of the N11, the next 11 emerging strong markets. So Pakistan has the economic potential, so how is it going to manage those internally? And only secondarily, um, what, what is it that they need from the outside? I think the other one is perhaps a more near-term one, and as the conflict in Afghanistan moves, hopefully to an end, <coughs> uh, but if not, to a very different type of regional engagement with the 2014 transition, um, I think there's an opportunity for Pakistan <coughs> to ask itself of others, but also be asked, how can Pakistan's legitimate interests be met? At the moment, Pakistan is being asked to do one thing and facilitate negotiations with the Taliban. I also think that perhaps not su given sufficient weight in this dialogue is recognizing that Pakistan has very legitimate interests in its neighbor and instability. And, perhaps, and that includes having a government in Kabul that is friendly to Pakistan, for one. Having an army that isn't too large that becomes a threat to Pakistan. Um, ensuring that Afghan territory isn't used to threaten Pakistan's interests and having more of a dialogue in the open as well as in private about how those interests can be met and through what mechanisms I think could move towards what, I, what seems to be necessary for future stability in the region which is a much more special, if one day hopefully a special relationship but at least in the short run, the medium run, a better relationship between the state of Afghanistan and the state of Pakistan. Thank you. I'm going to wrap up with one more question that draws upon many, several of the questions that were posed and the comments from the various panelists. To raise a paradox, when the US or the international community does stand back in Egypt, in Syria, et cetera, and, and allows, it well, stands back while the local forces play out, what implication does that have? How is it reconciled with R2P and with national security regionally? I think that, let me just try a quick answer because I'm going to have to run fairly quickly. Um, I think that if the question begins to border on mass killings and genocide, then I think there is an undoubted international interest in the, in the issue. And that's been basically the message of R2P. And that means that standing back becomes a Rwanda problem or a Rwanda result for us and everybody else. I think if the questions are economic development, investment, assistance, then I think the 
matter ought to be one where you do your best to try to tune as much as you can to local circumstances, recognizing that sometimes local circumstances aren't sufficient to produce change. But it has to be a much more cooperative, longer term, less kind of existential problem than the, than, than the genocide issue. I've often thought that the big problem with the Security Council was that in questions of genocide, if there was differences, uh, it would stymie the issue. And the veto of the permanent members of the Security Council should somehow, and you know, every government that has a veto would kill any diplomat who said this on their behalf, should somehow be worked out so that there would be more capacity uh, to find a strong resolution that could be broadly agreed. Um, in the end, if some country feels its vital interests are at stake and has the veto, then you're not going to be able to do that. But I often thought that um, if the standard was three countries opposed to a text, you could get a better text, if I could put it that way, at the same time get more consensus, and that the way to do that might be to seek to have the General Assembly say this is such an important problem that the three veto standard ought to be applied by the Security Council. I don't know whether it worked or not. I think it probably isn't going to work. Um, but if it didn't involve a vital interest but an important interest, you would get, I think, more response if, in fact, the Council and the General Assembly were connected in a way of that sort. And so with that lunatic idea, I'm afraid I have to excuse myself. Thank you very much. Thanks. I think that uh, one of the problems that we face with respect to the Security Council is that there is significant difference uh, among the members. It's not, you know, they all adhere to the charter, but beyond that, they don't all adhere to the same set of approaches, same set of values, same implementation of law, same emphasis, same priorities, and the like. So that the council can act uh, in certain circumstances uh, where we might think we ought to act, but it's hard to get the uh, entire council to agree. Syria, current set of issues with respect to Syria is an example, Kosovo is another, um, and the like. The second set of problems is that uh, some of this, you know, Tom mentioned that he thought there were some successes, small, and he mentioned small countries. Um, it's a lot easier to operate in a small country than it is to take on a big problem. Uh, you know, we've seen in the U.S. and its allies and its partners really reach the limits unless we've gone to a total, total war mobilization in countries that are 25 to 30 million Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, if you had a bigger set of issues, even harder. And you will notice that there, I call it what you like, but there's certainly very serious problems that have been ongoing for multiple, multiple years in the Congo. And no one has really been able to figure out what to do about it. And by this time, and I don't actually have the statistics, it's certainly high enough to warrant uh, you know, some kind of intervention, but it's not so easy to intervene because it's not clear that the intervention will actually cause a better result. Um, that's a very, very difficult problem. It's a moral problem, but it's also a fundamental practical problem for anyone who's contemplating uh, using some kind of intervention approach. Um, so I think those two uh, sets of issues really uh, make it very hard to take some steps. The, the only saving grace is that there are not so many Rwandas. Um, that is not to say that there aren't any. Um, it's just that there are not so many. And hopefully, as there has been development over the years, there will, there will be fewer. Um, but I do think that I was involved in it. I thought that the decision of NATO to go forward in Kosovo was the right decision, even absent a UN resolution. Uh, I was glad to see that we were able to get the appropriate resolutions uh, with respect to Libya, even though some countries thought they were tricked 
um, and maybe uh, you know maybe people took the words for all they were worth. Uh, that obviously hasn't solved all the problems this morning. Um, so I think you've got uh, a situation where we don't have a coherent international legal framework that's agreed by all the major powers, and even less so uh, by very important countries. And I'll go back to the example of cyber uh, for a minute. Um, quite a number of countries in Europe created the Brussels Convention on Cybercrime. If one reads it from a lawyer's perspective, it's reasonably adequate document to make, be able to make it better. All of us probably could make it better, but it says a lot of things. A lot of countries have refused to join basically because it was created out of Europe. Um, that's not the only, only reason, but it's a fundamental reason. It's a geopolitical reason and a, a refusal to have trust in a uh, convention that's created by someone else. Uh, how does one deal with that kind of problem, uh, I think, is a pretty important set of questions. And, you know, as the, if you will, Brazil's, Indonesia's, uh, other countries become more and more important, um, I think we need to really think our way through. So I think we're, we're missing the consensus uh, approach. Uh, NATO works on a consensus approach. Tom's example about well, of three countries, you, know, you really need three people to object or something like that. Uh, in NATO, you can object um, and then you sort of give way because the others want to do things. Uh, but we do not have that uh, agreement in the international arena by a long shot. Uh, I think it's something that's worth working to, uh, but until we can get some greater sense of where we're going, I think you're going to find that the laws themselves are not sufficient because there's not clarity as to what the policies ought to be. Thank you. Claire, you have a final words? The, the question has been beautifully answered already. Marvelous. Those are great words. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you to the panelists, and thank you for the audience.